Good morning. Happy Sunday. We did a message last week entitled Lessons from the Wilderness, Part 1. So it's only appropriate to do Part 2. I had to go through the wilderness this week to get there. How about you? You never like having to live stuff that you're preaching. But you always remember that if I'm going to preach it, I better be ready. So uh, I'm uh, working real hard on my computer this week. And uh, it just keeps going to this recycle thing, you know. Kind of like the way I feel some mornings trying to keep rebooting, you know. Kept rebooting. I thought, man, I don't know what's wrong with this thing. I, what I ought to do is what I have never done, which I was told to do when I got the computer, is to make a recovery disc. <laughs> just in case, right? So I get out my little USB stick and stick it in there and tell the recovery disc to the USB port there. And so uh, it's all going good until all of a sudden the computer does it again. Just shuts off, recycles, goes through the whole thing. And it boots back up and starts recycling and going through the motions like it's going to, you know, save everything for recovery disc. But what it does, it uh, selects the wrong USB port on the reboot. And I have this external hard drive that has my life on it for the last 40 years. Every sermon preached, every PowerPoint, every drama that we've written, every sermon outline every PowerPoint for the last 30 something years along with the index of where I preach, what I preach, when I preach it for every conference I've been in, every international conference, every, everything here and it's all gone. My last backup of that hard drive, it's external so I usually just use it as a main just to save it and take it off the machine case because usually it's my computer that goes down or my hard drive on it, never an external hard drive. Problem was it sought to format that drive I think and so I got to walk through the wilderness a little bit this week as I mourned the loss of almost 40 years of ministry, of just all the things that have been put together. Uh, now, the last backup that I do have that's still intact is about five or six years old, so it's maybe just six years of stuff, but uh, uh, it's one of those points you've got to just stop and praise the Lord and thank God it's all going to be okay. Uh, so if I end up preaching this next week what I preached a year ago, don't just get over it because I don't... <laughs> see. If I don't remember, you don't, so. <laughs> Amen. Sometimes I have trouble remembering what I preached last week. It has to have a slide that says part two. That way you know what you preached last week or very soon after. But God is good in all these things. Amen. But as we talked about in the wilderness part one time, that there are times we go through of great difficulty. Sometimes it's a time of just great aloneness where, you know, we're just suffering through or walking through something that nobody else really is dealing with and at least in our mind, we don't think they have dealt with or temptation or trial. It's always good to remember at that time that the Bible makes it clear that there's no temptation taken you, but such is common to man. We all go through issues. We all go through trials. We all go through temptations. We all through go, also go through wilderness experiences on our own where seem to be out there in a wilderness where there's just nothing. Now, remember, as you talk about the wilderness, uh, it's not like a lot of people think of a wilderness, at least in this, these good United States of ours, when people think of a wilderness here, they're thinking of maybe something like Alaska. <laughs> All right? This is not that kind of wilderness that we're talking about. And this is not the kind of wilderness that the Bible was talking about in regard to what Jesus went through and what Jesus experienced. All right? That was not a, an Alaskan wilderness with crisp running creeks and streams with salmon popping up out of the water and, you know, the wildlife everywhere you go with lots of berries to eat. All right? This is a place of desert. It's a place where there's just nobody else. It's a place of aloneness. It's a place of, of absolute, there's, there's no natural resources from which you're going to take from. And there are times in our life that we have to go through those experiences. And as we talked about in Deuteronomy chapter 8 last week, there are times where the Lord actually lets us go through. He leads us into those times. And this is, a, this is from the story of the children of Israel as they've been taken out of the bondage of the Egyptians and they're going into the wilderness on their way to the promised land. But the Lord had some things he wanted to do in them to prepare them for the promised land. And so they're going through this experience. Unfortunately, 40 years go by in this experience because that generation, it was the older generation in leaving the promised land, wouldn't believe God and wouldn't trust God and wouldn't accept the will of God on about anything. And so that whole generation passes before they come into this experience that they're in. And the Lord's addressing those who've been alive during this time. And he says, you know, he talks to them about the older generation not believing it's time for this generation to move forward. But in, in Deuteronomy chapter 8, he speaks to them and says, there's reasons behind all you've experienced in your life. He says, all the commandments that I'm commanding you today, you should be careful that you may live, that you may be careful to do, that you may live and multiply in and go in and possess the land, which the Lord swore to give to your forefathers. 
and you shall remember all the way which the Lord your God has led you in the wilderness these 40 years, that he might humble you and test you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. And he humbled you and he let you be hungry. And he fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might take, make you to understand that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by everything that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. Your clothing didn't wear out on you, nor did your foot swell these 40 years. Thus you are to know in your heart that the Lord your God was dis disciplining you just as a man disciplines his own sons. Now the Lord's saying, hey, I led you through these wilderness, you know, uh, that for, for a reason. You're experiencing everything that you're experiencing for a reason. A lot of times we look back at these situations we get into in our life that are difficult or, you know, we feel like maybe others don't understand or we feel maybe that God even doesn't understand and have to realize that in those moments that God is doing something. In fact, with every difficulty, we so often step back and the first thing we do many times is just question God, like why? Why God are you allowing this? And I think it's because we don't understand the ways in which the Lord works in our life. And this is what he's speaking to these people. He's talking about it's important. And he gives them this key phrase in, in verse two of this whole thing. He says, you shall remember the way in which the Lord led you. As I said last week, it's not in the way of, you know, you went this way, you turned left, you went this way, you went south, you went this way, you went north. So then you came here and you crossed that river. No, he's talking about in the way, that there's a way in which God works in our life. And this way has to do with the entirety of our life. That right now in your life, no matter what you're experiencing, God is teaching you something. God is showing you something. God's revealing something of himself to you. And even revealing, as we saw last week, something about you that you may not know of. And all too often, instead of allowing God to instruct and to guide and to lead us, we're too busy, frustrated, complaining about what we're having to deal with and trying to get God to somehow intervene on my poor little situation and make it different. In fact, we believe all too often that victory is in God changing our circumstances, in God removing the problem, in God destroying the enemy completely. And we just haven't seen how the God really works. He said, I led you in the wilderness to teach you you know, this way, it, it, there's a way of understanding that this, there's a journey involved here and there's a way in which I'm leading you to all this. And I, I love the way he put it. He said, you need to understand these commandments I've given you, I've given to you to obey. So why? He said, so you can live. God gives us his word so we can have life. All too often people look at the word of God like it's some book of, of, of restrictions or some book of instruction that just it's do's and don'ts, and they don't realize that God has set his word out here so that we can feast on it and have abundant life and full and complete life. So I, I, I gave you this word so that, you could, so that you, could, so you could live and that you could multiply and you could fully possess the land which I've laid out to give you. Now we know in typology and in symbolism that the promised land for the New Testament folks is really that the spirit-filled life, the life of victory, the life of fullness. And too many Christians, they never cross over Jordan to get into that life of fullness. They've, they come to Jesus Christ and they're right there at the Jordan, which is a symbol of death to self, and they never really cross over and just die to themselves so they can really experience the full life that God has for them. They're too busy wandering around the wilderness looking at God's word like it's some kind of you know, legal book of instruction if they do it this way or do it that way and be happy or not be happy. And they don't realize that the fullness of God's word is there to, that they can really fully enjoy life and fullness of life and to know God. So what, what has to happen? How do we learn? How do we grow? The Lord allows these situations in our life, difficulties and problems. But understand that with every problem, with every difficulty that we face in our life, it carries with it the possibility of an equal or even a greater benefit for our life if we'll learn to live by faith, if we'll learn to hear what God's saying, if we'll learn to go the way God's given us and learn to walk with God in those situations. That's why the Bible says in, in Romans where Paul makes a statement, listen, everything works together. God causes all things and his sovereignty causes all things to work together for our benefit, for our good. Now that's the glory and the grace of God that we all too often don't understand. We think that somehow if we're going through a difficult situation, man, God must be mad at me. Like I said last Sunday, I would bet the majority of the people in the room feel like God's mad at you about something. And that's not the way the Lord wants you to conduct your life or to enjoy your walk, enjoy your life. God loves you. God's committed to you. God's given everything for you. He said, if he gave not his own son for you, don't you think he's going to provide for you all the things that you need in your life? That's a different picture than what most people hold in their mind. 
Because it's that same old lie that Satan's been telling a long, long time. It started in the garden. Eve, God's trying to keep something from you. You know, God's trying to, God's trying to keep you from being happy. Now, if you really want to be happy, if you really want it, then you need to do this. That's the same way Satan always works. It's always the same old lie that God's trying to make you miserable when the truth of the fact is Jesus said, I've come, you may have life that's abundant. So are we going to believe lies or are we going to be truth? Well, he's saying, hey, there's lessons to be learned in the wilderness, you know, and part of that lesson is learning all the way in which the Lord led you. Remember last week I quoted Psalms 103 where David was telling the children of, of, of Israel and reminding the people of God that the people of God in the, in, in the wilderness, that those people, they saw the works of God and they saw a great deliverance. They saw the plagues, they saw the works, they saw the water flowing out of the rock, they saw streams in the desert. I mean, they saw the miracle, miraculous hand of God. But that verse in, in 103 went on to say, but Moses knew the ways of God. It's wonderful to see what God can do. But it's more wonderful to see how God moves and to understand the ways of God because that means in reality that we're learning how to know God more effectively and more efficiently and more in reality in our life. But unfortunately, most of us don't like the fact that it's usually in the wilderness where we learn these lessons. It's in the time of our trial that we learn these lessons. Last week we talked about lesson one was to learn the sufficiency of God. God said, you know, I led you these years. Uh, I, I brought you into this wilderness to teach you, you know, to, to live in humility. And we talk about humility is really just God dependency. I mean, the truest form of humility is not kind of tucking your hat down here and bowing your head and feeling all weak and humble. True humility means that my trust, my dependence is, is on the Lord. Pride is when my dependence is, is upon me. Pride says, I can get through this, I can do this, I'll deal with this, I'll take care of this. And most of us kind of have that mindset, but I want you to know the great day comes in the wilderness when we realize that maybe I can't. <laughs> Truth of the matter is I can't. And that I need God. And more than anything else today, whether I'm in trouble or whether things are going great, still it's back, I need God. And one of the great lessons that we learn is that sufficiency of God that he's able, that he provided for them in the wilderness. Their shoes didn't wear out, their, their feet didn't swell. I mean, they couldn't farm, they couldn't dig wells, they couldn't do business, they couldn't carry out commerce, but God met every need of their life. Their clothes didn't wear out. He fed them with manna. They never even knew manna existed, but God just spoke manna into existence and he, he supplied their needs. It was in those times of desperation out in the wilderness with no other means for economic gain to supply the necessities of life, which we all think about. It was in those times when they didn't have the capability to do that that God said, hey, I'm meeting your needs. I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to see that you're fed and you're taken care of. No, you can't produce clothing, so don't, but don't worry, yours is not going to wear out. No, you can't produce food, but I'm going to have groceries every morning. I'm going to take care of you. And they saw the power of God and the provision of God. But there's this lesson that should be learned in the midst of all that, hey, that no matter when things are good or bad, I still need God. And he's the one who ultimately meets my needs. He's one ultimately that provides everything anyway. Lesson number two we talked about last week was that lesson of self-revelation I mentioned a while ago. It says, remember, he wanted you to know what was in your heart. And we have to get in crisis moments usually in our life to really discover what's in our heart. We get in the squeeze, you know, so to say, of difficulty and the squeeze of trial and the squeeze of, of crisis in our life. And what, what comes out when we're being squeezed kind of gives us a real realization of what's in. I mean, if you squeeze an orange, what kind of juice comes out? So you squeeze a lemon, what comes out? Well, don't squeeze a lemon and expect orange juice. All right, you're going to get, don't squeeze a grapefruit and expect something sweet. You, what comes out is what is in. And all too often, we're really so full of ourselves that we don't realize it, and we don't realize how foul that can be, and we discover it when we're put in the squeeze, so we end up getting a real, real realization and a revelation of what our heart is really like. It's in the times of difficulty that those things are exposed, and you know, don't get too frustrated. Realize that's the old man, and that's the old self, and you realize, hey, I have God, I have his grace, so I'm going to put that aside, and I'm going to trust God. So the realization and revelation doesn't come there to make your life miserable. It comes to free you. It comes to liberate your life. So those are the two things we talked about last week. Lesson three goes on like this. We call it the lesson of spiritual reality. And what do you say, what do you, what do you mean by that? This is the lesson that's so important that <clears throat> so few Christians really ever learn. And the Bible says that we're saved by, <clears throat> by grace through faith. I mean, we put our faith and our trust in Jesus Christ and we're saved. All right? Now, what is faith? Faith is, well, we heard what God said. We're sinners. We heard that God could save us and will save us. 
We heard that Jesus died on the cross so that we could be saved. We heard that Jesus was raised from the dead by God the Father, which basically is the, the, the ultimate acceptance of God's sacrifice, that he accepted the sacrifice of Jesus for our sins, and now he raises Jesus to be the Lord. And we heard that truth, and so we believe from our heart. That's faith. Based on what? Based upon the facts of God's word. That's great to be saved by faith. The only way you're going to get saved is faith, putting your trust in God's word. But the Bible says that the just shall not only be saved by faith, the just shall live by faith. Now, that's our life. That's our walk. It's to be a faith life, and it's to be a faith walk. But so few Christians, they, they don't seem to ever come to this, this understanding. And it's in these times of difficulty, this is the place we need to really learn this lesson. He says in verse 3, he says, listen, I'm trying to make you to know, you know, to, 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 you would understand that man doesn't live by bread only. Man lives by what comes out of the mouth of God, which is what? Word. The Word of God. How do we live our life? Our life has to be based upon the Word of God. What does God say? Well, God said I was a sinner. I believe that. God said I could be saved. I believe that. God said put your faith in Jesus. I did that. So I trusted him. But now the Bible is filled with his promises and filled with his instruction and filled with his living word to help me and to guide me and to lead me to navigate this life that I'm in as a believer. I'm not to live my life now by my feelings anymore. I'm not to live my life by what circumstances might dictate. I'm not to live my life by, by what others are doing. I now discover there's a whole new life to be lived, and it's the faith life. It's a spiritual life. It's not like the old life that I used to live before I knew Christ. That life was, was determined by what others did or what others might say to me, and I respond and react according to that, or by what the weather might do. It's a bad day, bad weather. I have a bad attitude. People are not being nice to me. I won't be nice to them. Circumstances aren't good, so I'm not good. If things are bright, I'm right. If things are bright, I'm bright. If things are dark, I'm dark. In other words, that's that real physical sense world, all right, that's around us. We, that's what we touch, uh, we feel, we, we taste, we smell, we see. Those are the things that govern our life in a physical world alone. And too many people live their life that way. They're just governed by what they see with their physical eyes. But the faith life is different. The faith life looks to the Word of God. The faith life, what, what is God saying? Listen to this, this verse in the New Living Translation where he, he puts it this way. He humbled you. He let you go hungry. Then he fed you with manna, a food previously unknown to you and your ancestors. He did it to teach you that people need more than bread for their life. Real life comes by free feeding on every word of the Lord. Real life comes by understanding what the Bible has to say putting your life on the line of God's word and saying, I'm going to do what God said to do in this situation. It, it, it applies in every of my, of my life. The world says if someone offends you, offend them. Isn't that what it says? Jesus said, love your enemies. Excuse me, that doesn't make any sense. The world says if they slap you, you slap them. The world says if they, if they belittle you, you belittle them. The world says if they're not nice to you, you're not nice to them. The world says if they hate you, then you hate them. The world says, you know, and constantly our flesh and the system and the culture we live in has its own set of standards and guidelines which are so far removed from God that if we don't know God and we don't know his word, we'll live our lives completely wrong and we'll live our life that is completely defeated. We we'll just it's, 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 it's say, well, it's like schizophrenia and it's beyond that. All right, this is not spiritual schizophrenia. I know who I am in Christ. This old man, I know who it is. This is the, the person I knew I was before Jesus. It's not the person I am after Jesus. Now, even though it is present in its old nature, it's been dealt a death blow. Now, it doesn't mean it has ceased to be. It means it is powerless in reality, that I don't have to do what my old person tells me to do. I'm a new person in Christ. I'm now indwelt by the Holy Spirit, and I have as my instruction the Word of God. And it is the Holy Spirit's ministry, his job description, is to take the word of God, bring it alive to me, so I know how to live my life. Are you with me? It's, it's like you're in the flesh, but you're in the spirit. A great illustration of this is found in the book of Revelation, chapter 1, when John, the revelator, you know, he's getting ready to receive this great word from God, but he's on the Isle of Patmos. Now, if you remember, the, uh, the Isle of Patmos is a prison island, right? It's a miserable place. It's a rock heap. It's a horrible place to live. 
And he's been exiled to Patmos along with other prisoners. It's not a picnic. It's not the Bahamas. All right? It's not a Caribbean island. Even though it's a Mediterranean island, it's a rock heap. It's hot and it's miserable. And it's cold in winter and hot in summer. It's a God-forsaken place. It's the last place you want to be, let me put it that way. And to be exiled to. And he's put there. He says, I, John, was on the Isle of Patmos on the Lord's Day. Next part of the verse says, in the spirit. I'm in one of the most God-forsaken places you can be and one of the most God-blessed places you can be. Patmos, spirit. Now, am I going to let Patmos run me and determine how I'm going to live my day to day? Or am I going to let the Holy Spirit determine my day to day? Isn't that a great illustration there from Scripture? Two places at one time. Well, so are we. We're two places. at one. We're in the flesh, in this body, but all the Holy Spirit lives in us. And the Bible says, hey, now we are spiritual. We're no longer flesh, but we're children of God and we're children of the Spirit. And we've been birthed into a spiritual family now. Now I want to live my life based on my new heritage, all right? Based on my new genealogy. What is the will of God? How does God work? This is the same thing that the apostle was saying. And so few people seem to get a grasp on. In 2 Corinthians, when he said, this light affliction, you know, this, oh, pass that one up. It's the next verse. He said, this light affliction is but for a moment. And it works for us a, more far, a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen, they're just temporal, temporary. But the things which are not seen, they're eternal. You say, that just sounds like a bunch of spiritual gobbledygook looking at things that aren't seen. How do you do that? Well, let me tell you, when you gave your life to Christ, you got the capacity to see, really see. John was writing to the church in 1 John. He says, you know, it says, we're of God, little children. We want to say, he says, you know, and we know, we perceive that the whole world lies in wickedness. In other words, when we, we came to Jesus Christ, we got a new set of eyes. You know, the eyes that see now, eyes that are open. Once I was blind, but now I see. That's not a euphemism. That's a reality. You can now see things differently in Christ Jesus. It's a new set of vision, new capacity. See, so, but what we're looking at now is different. I used to look at the world and I would judge my day and my being and my status and my happiness based on what's happening. Do I have money? Do I not have money? Do I have things? Do I not have things? Do I have the things I want? Are the circumstances lining up? And if everything, is everything happening good? Because if everything's happening good, then I can be happy. And if everything's not happening good, then I'm not happy. So what I need to do? I need to change everything and everyone so I can be happy. I don't have to change everything and everyone to be happy when I'm looking with my spiritual eyes. I can look with my spiritual eyes and I can be satisfied and blessed and happy because I'm not depending on the world to change or circumstances to change or things to change. I'm trusting the Lord God Almighty as my source and my resource for life and living. So what's he saying? I look at things that are not seen. I look at things that are seen. What's seen? My problems are seen. My crisis is seen. My sickness is seen. My illness is seen. My complications are seen. Uh, my kids, my wife, my, my husband, my spouse. Things may not be working out just the way I want it, but I want you to know that I'm not going to look at those things. I'm going to look at what? I'm going to look at what the Bible has to say. What does the Bible have to say? Well, that's not a trite, cute little saying, folks. The Bible is filled with these covenant promises of God. And when I say covenant promise, that means that God is bound to keep them. He's committed to you in this regard. But if you ignore the word and you ignore these promises and you're not in his promise and you don't study his word and you don't read his word and you don't take heed to the word of God, you just kind of come in on Sunday morning and out, but the word of God's not really a vital part of your life. How are you going to know how to live by faith? How are you going to know what to believe God for? How are you going to know what to trust God for? There are wilderness experiences, folks, where there's nobody around us with a word. We just have to get a word from God. Listen, I don't know that we... We understand this eternal versus this temporal. When Paul said, I look at the things that are temporal or, or eternal, I mean temporal, what is temporal? Well, my circumstances are temporal, right? It's all change in an instant. Boom, it can change. It can change for the worst in an instant. My mom wrote me a card one day that says, you know, everything can change in the blink of an eye. But don't worry, God doesn't blink. <laughs> you know? It could all change. Your circumstances can radically change in an instant. Does that mean I'm going to be miserable today or tomorrow because all that changes? I don't have to be because it's temporary. This world is temporary. It's fleeting. This building we're sitting, it's temporary. 
Should the Lord delay 100 years, I doubt this thing will be standing. Somebody will plow it under and put something else up. Hopefully a bigger church. Amen. Amen. You know, we, we just don't know. The house you're living in, hope you're enjoying it because, you know, a thousand years from now, hey, listen, if the Lord comes today and the tribulation goes through this period and we have this thousand year reign of Christ, the end of that thousand years, I want you to know everything's going to be erased. There's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. This earth is going to be clothed for a moment with a fire and it's going to be a rebirth of the earth. All right, it's all going to change in an instant, ultimately. So what, what do we depend on? That which could change in a moment? I mean, your job could change in a moment. Your health can change in a moment. Your status, your life situation can change. No, I think I'll put my trust in something a little more solid and a little more eternal, and that would be God and his word and what he says about my life and choose to live my life according to his principles and what he teaches in the Bible. Instead of by living by, by one storm to another storm, I'm living like on a troubled sea that settles every once in a while, but storms most of the time, always wondering, my ship going down today? I can't make it like this. But that's the way a lot of people live their lives. And they're living their life with their minds set on on temporary things. I, you know, I started to title this message, What You Looking At? <laughs> what You Looking At? I may say, Who You Looking At? It ought to be the Lord. That's what we're looking at, His Word. And that's what He means, is we, our mind and our eye. And the Lord says, Listen, you're going through what you're going through so I can teach you how to live a life of faith, a life that means something. And so many people, Well, you know, that faith, that's just kind of stepping out. Have you heard that? It's just a leap into the dark. And it's not, faith is not blind ignorance, some step into, you know, in, into darkness. It's an it's a open-eyed step into what God says. That's light. It's stepping into God's word is stepping into light. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path, not darkness. It's darkness to the world. They don't understand why you would do what you would do because it's contrary to what they do. Why would you give a blessing instead of curse it? Because that doesn't make any sense. What's the matter with you? Nothing to matter with me. Everything's right with me. Because I'm choosing to live by faith. And a lot of people say, oh, you know, I'm in the wilderness, so that's, that's when I don't know what to do. That's when you need to take the opportunity to say, hey, I need to hear from you, God. I, I need to know what you want. I need to know what your will is. But that, I think, if you'll be honest, that's why you're there. Slow down. Take a breath. What's God up to? What's going on? And usually, I won't do that on my own. Neither will you. It takes usually an act of God to get us to that place to slow down. And what are you doing, God? What are you saying to me? What do you want from me? What is it you're up to? And in that moment, that's why we shouldn't be afraid of wilderness experiences. In that moment, that's when God starts speaking to us. I was reading one time from George Mueller. He was talking about being in these times and the great man of faith, great man of prayer. And he, and he was talking about, you know, when you're looking at the invisible and hearing from God and realizing the word of God. He said these five things, you know, in, in, in regard to, to what it means to, to live by the word of God and to live this spiritual life where you're going to live by faith. He said, maybe you don't know what the will of God is, but let me give you some principles. Now, I'm going to give you five things, and I'm just going to lay them out real quick because these are really five different sermons in themselves, but you can take and chew on them yourself. He said, first of all, if you don't know what God wants, I want you to first of all get to the place where you, it's a position of freedom. What does that mean? That means you're willing to get to the place to accept a yes or a no with God. It's not passivity. It's to say, okay, God, I'm ready. If you say yes, yes. If it's no, it's no. But I'm, I'm ready to do whatever you want. And that, that is a sermon in itself because that's where we fight so often to getting to. But now it seems in the wilderness, we're just about there, all right? <laughs> so take a position of freedom. The second thing would be this. Seek the guidance of the Holy Spirit through the Word of God. You've got to get in the Word. You've just got to get into God's Word. And you don't have to go, I'm not talking about open up the Bible and stick your thumb on something, you know. He ran out quickly and killed himself. That's usually when I do if I hit that one, all right? <laughs> He went out and hung himself, you know. So, no. It's, it's, say, I don't even know where to begin. Just start reading one of the Proverbs a day. We've talked about that before. One Proverbs, one chapter a day, according to whatever the day of the month it is. Start reading through the Gospel of John. If you haven't been in the Word, just go back to the Gospel of John and read it through this month. And then read it through again this month, and then read it through a third time. You may start getting it by then. 
Just take some time. And there's so many good sources out there for Bible studies and reading the Bible and studying the Bible out there on the Internet and the bookstores. Just, but just do it. Whatever way you choose to do it, get in the Word of God. And you'll discover that as you're just reading through the Word of God in a systematic way in your life, that God will speak to you. He'll, those, some of those verses will come right off the page and they'll speak to you and you'll know exactly what to do. But you've got to begin to say to the, to, to the Lord, say, Lord, I'm trusting you to guide me by the power of your Holy Spirit and through the wisdom of your Holy Spirit. And God will guide you in Scripture and he'll give you a word. The third thing is observe God in your circumstances. You're in a situation. Is God trying to dictate something to you there that you're not healing, hearing? Has God ordained it? Now, I'm not saying that God uses every circumstance to reveal his will, all right? But I say there's sometimes God puts us in a situation we need to be paying a very close attention because God may be saying something in that circumstance to me, and I'm just refusing to hear it. Pay attention to what God's saying to you. The fourth thing is this. Ask God just to reveal his will. You say, well, I want to do that as number one. Well, you weren't ready at number one. <laughs> you were still at number one saying, well, tell me what it is. I'll see if I'll do it. <laughs> if it's not too hard, it doesn't cost too much, or it doesn't take me where I don't want to go. No. Now you're at a place where you can hear God speak. So now you're asking God to reveal his will to you. And the fifth thing is that as you begin to move forward, you just follow God's peace. You say, what do you mean? God gives you peace about stuff. If you're heading the wrong way, isn't it interesting? If you've walked and lived with the Lord very long, isn't it interesting how you know in your heart you're heading the wrong place? It's just like, you know, the idiot lights on the dashboard when they light up and something's wrong with the engine goes off. You know that, you know, the idiot light comes on the sides. It's kind of like, you idiot, you go any further with this, you're going to be in trouble. All right? That's, that's why we call them idiot lights. You're going to ruin your car if you go any further without checking this out possibilities of danger are there. So when those lights go off in your spirits, back up and go where the Lord is giving you freedom and go where the Lord is giving you peace and go where the Lord's speaking his grace to your spirit. Listen, those five points right there will change your life, especially in a wilderness situation. God, I need to hear from you. God, I need to know what you want. God, I want what you want. God, it's my desire. Now, these last two lessons are pretty quick and pretty simple. This is the five things that come out of these passages. One is the lesson of God's steadfast love. Verse 5 says this. Then, she, then shalt thou also consider in thine heart that as a man chastens his son, so the Lord God chastens thee. The living, New Living Translation of this says, you should realize that as a parent would discipline his child, the Lord God disciplines you to help you. Let me say it in a way that maybe your English language will get a little closer. You should take careful, careful note mentally that as the Lord God is leading you, it's the same way that a loving parent would disciple and lead his child. The great role of a parent in a child's life gets down to that role of the discipler, the leader, the teacher. The role that God has in your life that we so often misunderstand or overlook is the fact that he really is father. Not just father and that he loves you. Not just father that he gave you life. Not just father and he's put a roof over your head. But father and that he is a genuine father who seeks to lead and disciple and to teach you every step of your life. Father. Remember what I said at the beginning of the sermon? All too many people have a feeling that God's just mad at them. <laughs> when in reality, God just loves them. And God may be grieved with your actions, but God still holds in his place. Listen, there's been times when my children are very small, and even as they get older, it's life in general, that our children, we, we have great expectations, and we want them to reach a certain place. And so we're moving them gently and by grace to teach and instruct. This is right. This is wrong. This is what you say. This is what you don't say. This is how you act. This is how you respond. All those things as parents were doing all have a goal in mind that they might be full and mature and complete in their life and find fullness and happiness in their life. Well, how do you think God's dealing with you? Why do you think God's dealing with you? We use this word discipline. We, we don't understand it. We think of spanking. You don't discipline. You get a spanking. I mean, that what you think of when discipline comes? Hey, I had too many spankings as a kid. That's what I've always thought of. I'll be honest. Spanking. And I got to the point, I was almost proud I'd had so many spankings. I held the record in junior high school for the most spankings. That was a badge of honor, I thought. Stupidity. Now, they don't spank in school anymore. I know that, all right? Some of you younger people might not understand that. <laughs> but we had coaches with long paddles with holes in them, but well, never mind. 
brings back too much sorrow. <laughs> but that's what we think with God, ain't it? God, man, we've got God. It's all God. Hey, God says, you need to wake up and realize I led you to this place for a reason. My motivation is my love for you. My motivation is because I love you. And you need to know how to live your life the right way. And if I leave you out there, you're never going to learn it. You're going to make a miserable wreck out of everything. So I'm bringing you to a place in your life where you can understand how much I love you, and I'm here. In fact, this word chase and, and discipline is the Hebrew word yasar, all right? And it really means it has to do more with instruction and preparation as well as that discipline or reprimanding or reproving, all right? I mean, little kids, they don't get this either. I mean, I didn't get it, you know. I didn't, I didn't get that deal. I thought it was a bald-faced lie when Mama told me, or, you know, my stepdad told me, it's going to hurt me more than it hurts you. I said, yeah, buddy, let's trade then. <laughs> I'll be willing to switch roles here. But I never enjoyed disciplining my children. Ever. Grieve my heart how l l much less of that I would have had to endure if I'd taken the other positive side of the instruction. And it's the same in my spiritual walk in life, amen? There's this lesson. I have to understand God's concerned for me. God cares for me. God loves me. God cares about you. God's concerned about you. God has you in mind with all you're going through that you say, Don't, have you forgotten me? No, I haven't forgotten you. In fact, my attention is on you, so you need to pay attention. He says, you need to think carefully about it. This is the words he uses. You need to consider well. You need to understand why you're dealing with what you're dealing with because if you miss this, you're going to be a miserable person. Let's remember the grace of God. And the love of God. The last is this. The fifth reason that we walk through the wilderness from this book. In fact, it really goes into a whole book later. Joshua is taking the people in. They're possessing the land. They're starting to drive out the enemies. And then it gets where Joshua passes. And now we're in the book of Judges. And Joshua has just now recently passed from the scene. And it, the Lord's telling him, hey, there's another lesson I'm trying to teach you. Because a whole new generation has come up as well. And he, and he kind of repeats some of the things he says to them in Deuteronomy 8. He said, listen, I, I will not henceforth drive out any from before them of the nations which Joshua left when he died, that through them I may prove Israel whether they will keep the way of the Lord to walk therein as their fathers did keep it or not. Therefore the Lord left those nations without driving them out hastily, and neither delivered he them into the hand of Joshua. All right? Now, these are the nations which the Lord left to prove Israel by them, even as many as Israel, as had not known all the ways of Canaan, only that the generations of the children of Israel might know to teach them war, lest such as before knew nothing thereof. Now this is interesting. He says, these things are left in your life. It would be nice if God just kill the devil today and move all my problems. Can I get a witness? All right? Just wipe out all the enemies, deal with all my temptations, wipe out this, it'll be a whole lot easier. Hey, that day's coming, I don't have to deal with any of that. But you know what's happening right now? I'm being prepared for the day that's coming. God's doing something in my life. He says, here's what I need you to do. I, I've taught you the, the, the lesson of, of God's sufficiency. I've taught you the lesson of your inadequacies and your, your inefficiencies and your, your lack of sufficiency. I, I've taught you now that you, you, you're going to live by the word of God. You're not going to live by yourself. And I've now taught you that you, I'm a loving father. And I, all the motivation here is my concern and my compassion for you. But he said, hey, next thing I'm going to teach you, teach you guys how to make war. What he says to them, I'm going to teach you guys how to fight. I left these, I, these are your enemies, and you're going to have to go take them out. You're going to have to learn how to fight. Folks, we're in a war. And so many Christians fail to grasp that. They just, it's just kind of like they, they fail to realize that this is a battle that we're in. And this is a battle scenario that we're in. That there's a battle against the flesh, there's a battle against the world, there's a battle against the devil. I mean, I have to battle my own self. I have to come to place with grips in my life. Hey, my way to overcome the old man is to lay him down in the grave in the morning. I'm dead indeed into sin. And my way to victory now is to move forward. But I have an enemy out here called Satan and his little de demon, demonic minions. And they hate me. And they're opposed to me. And they will do everything they can, lay out every trap, every subtle thing they can. They know me as well as I know me, probably better than I know me in many ways. And they're out there to destroy my life. And then there's a culture out here that's hell-bent, should I say, 
and pulling me away from God in my walk with him. So I have to realize that I have to be a man of war. The Lord is a man of war. And I'm going to have to go to war.